Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. So this evening, what I'd like to talk about is the same theme that I used a couple of nights ago in here for the ending of this two-month practice period, um, which has to do with the spirit or vision with which one carries the wisdom of the temple. And the temple, of course, could be the outer form But more importantly, it's what you touch inside when you come to the temple. How one carries that back into the um, midst of and the the play of the complicated daily modern society of your life. And I'll start with an image or a story. When I was living in Thailand, which I have on and off, starting in the 60s. That's where I spent some years as a Buddhist monk, among other things. In the 1970s, there was a revolutionary period where the Thai um, government was being run by some military generals, and it was relatively repressive. Um, And then there was a student rebellion, um, as you may notice, happens periodically in parts of the world. Um, And it's partly why I told this story to these people who'd been sitting for two months because they didn't know about Egypt and Tunisia and (laughs) Libya, not to speak about what happened in Japan. So it was like, all right, well, here's the news. Um, And in the the worst of that particular Thai uh, conflict, um, on this great boulevard, Raja Damnarn Avenue that goes down toward the palace, on one side was the military, and on the other side were makeshift barricades that the students had put up. And there, you know, there had been shouting and then some fighting, and eventually it got worse, and the military had actually shot and killed a number of demonstrators. And it was, Thailand generally has more peaceful revolutions than that, but this one was getting pretty bad. And at the height of it, uh, an abbot who had a forest monastery not so far outside of Thailand, called his monks and nuns together, and they traveled to Bangkok um, from the dark very early in the morning and walked with their robes and bowls as monks and nuns do out in the villages in Thailand. Um, And then in the morning when all of the heat of this conflict uh, started again and things were really getting difficult, the abbot and his monks and nuns who'd walked miles to come (coughs) walked right in between the lines of the military and the students and turned, held their bowls, and just stood there and did standing meditation for two or three hours. And everything started to cool and quiet, partly because there's so much respect for the monks and the lives and nuns and the lives they live in Thailand, Um, and the symbol of the robes that um, the military began to relax and realize maybe what they're doing were doing wasn't exactly the optimal approach to life Um, and the students began to remember some compassion and some sensibility from the Buddhist teaching that wasn't just around you know escalating the conflict and by the time those uh, two hours or three hours of them standing there had finished um, and then it was time for them to leave midday. Everything had relaxed and calmed down enough that that was kind of the apogee of the disruption in Thailand and from the, after that day there began to be the kind of dialogue that is inevitable and necessary in conflict where people somehow find a way after a long or short time, after a terrible time or not, where they find a way to live together. And I use that image, um, first because it was quite moving, but secondly because it carries the spirit 
of what it means to walk from the temple or drive, as you will, tonight and go back into a world that has a lot of conflict and that has a lot of um, difficulty. What is it that you can carry? And even if you come here on occasion to sit and meditate or practice or learn, um, what matters is not just that you're able to be in a somewhat protected environment and learn to quiet the mind, open the heart, center yourself, but that you can treasure and value and embody that um, in the other parts and times of your life. And that's really what it's for. My greatest weapon, said Mahatma Gandhi, is mute prayer. That Gandhi knew how to be still and to be present and listen very respectfully, but how to listen. Or Bob Dylan, who says, what else can you do for people but inspire them? Thank you, Bobby. It's nice to quote Gandhi and Dylan in the same. (laughs) It's just for the fun of it. So here, you know, we are, there seems to be this juxtaposition, if you will, from the, the temple, which is a place of reminding us, a place that reminds us of uh, sacred space, of the sacredness of life, or just lets us quiet the mind and open so that when you come here, this extraordinary spring day, that you come back to yourself, to your body, to your feelings, so busy, kind of reconnect. And it's hard because we live in a society that is primarily... um, one characterized by the absence of the sacred and where things are divided. You know, you do your body at the gym and you do your money in the marketplace and you do, you know, um, work at the office and, um, you know, the sacred is relegated to a little time when you meditate or you go to church or whatever. Everything's sort of divided. Um, Sun Bear, the Indian medicine... Chippewa Indian medicine man says, I do not think that the measure of a civilization is how tall its buildings of concrete are, but rather how well its people have learned to relate to their environment and the fellow beings around them. And so we come somehow to find a connection, and you know how it is. I mean, all the while there's this impetus to um, of consumerism and um, speed and uh, it's pretty easy to lose ourselves as a matter of fact Julia Childs she writes in department stores so much unnecessary kitchen equipment (laughs) is bought indiscriminately by by people who just came in for men's underwear (laughs) and there's some way in which you know there we are we have some intention and then we just get waylaid by the forces around us. Um, And what would it mean not to compartmentalize? You know? What would it mean to have a sense of the temple or the sacred in all the different areas of our life in relation to the body and emotions and family and community? Um, Because with the continuing warfare and racism and environmental destruction, no amount of technological improvement is really going to solve it. Because we've seen, I think it was in the 1950s, General Omar Bradley, who was the Joint Chiefs of Staff at that time, said we're a nation of nuclear giants and ethical infants in some way. There has to be a commensurate um, development of the human heart that has to go together, the inner and the outer. And then it becomes a question of what beauty can I create? What spirit, what spirit can I live this life with so that, it, so that you become the one standing between those two lines? And not in a literal way, but in the place you live, in the family that you're a part of, in the community that you care about. Now, one of the beautiful languages in Buddhist teachings for carrying this spirit is the 
um, teachings of the Bodhisattva, which is a compound Sanskrit word. Bodhi means liberated or awakened, and sattva means being. And so its meaning is that uh, a bodhisattva is one who's committed to the welfare or, or to the awakening or compassion uh, for all that lives, the liberated heart connected with all, all life and all beings. And there are all kinds of bodhisattva vows that people take in various tradition, Buddhist tradition, sentient beings are numberless, I vow to bring awakening to them all. That's a kind of tough one. You know, if you start with the people near you, I'm going to help liberate the ones in my family. It's, you know, you've tried that. It's tough, isn't it? Right? I remember seeing a cartoon. I think it was in The New Yorker. It's, it was, it was this, the, the title was The Superhero's Bar. And you go in and there was this, you know, in the background, you can see Batman and Spider-Man and this bar. And there's two guys in capes standing next to one another are sitting next to one another with their drinks, and one said, wow, you save people from themselves? That's a really tough one, you know? (laughs) But here's the Dalai Lama's Bodhisattva vows that come from Shantideva, this ancient Indian sage. May I be a guard for those who need protection, a guide for those on the path, a boat, a ridge, a bridge, a raft for those to cross the flood. May I be a resting place for the weary and healing medicine for those who are sick, food for the hungry. May I be a lamp for those in darkness. May I bring sustenance and awakening, enduring longer than earth and sky until all beings are freed from sorrow and all are awakened together. And that's his morning little prayer that he makes. Kind of amazing prayer to make. I offer my life in that way. And at the same time, tremendously beautiful or inspiring. And the point is that when you make such a vow as a bodhisattva, or when you set your life in that direction, um, it doesn't mean that you can measure it very easily by, you know, the results around you, um, because the human world is the way that it is, and it's not given to you to be able to fix the whole world, but it's given to you to contribute the wisdom and the love that's really the deepest thing that you carry in your life. Um, And to do that, um, not just for everybody else, but because it's Uh, some understanding that it's also a part of you. Um, This is Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He writes, If only it were all so simple. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were just necessary to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being, And who among us is willing to destroy a piece of their own heart? And so to undertake the practice of the bodhisattva is not to see that the people or beings around you are really different, but that to come into human incarnation puts us in the middle of this wild predicament of desire and fear and confusion and small sense of self here and incredible nobility and dignity and capacity for freedom also that is your birthright. O nobly born, begin the Buddhist text, do not forget who you really are as you wander through this world and all the situations you find yourself. Remember your dignity. Remember your nobility. So you see Aung San Suu Kyi or Nelson Mandela coming out of 27 years of Robben Island prison with such magnanimity and graciousness and forgiveness and courage that not only could he change modern South Africa, but really became an inspiration for the whole of humanity. So how to do this? You know, the room full of people that you have supplanted that were sitting here for the two months, 
they, as they sat in meditation, they got very still, different ones of them, and had visions and very deep understandings and a lot of healing, too. Sometimes you sit quiet and the mind gets really still and you hear the sound of the, the, the bird or you go out and you see you know, the spring flowers and you're so still that you can't tell that you're separate from the flower. It's like you have the same last name as the redbud trees in the yard. And there's, You know what that's like from childhood where you just feel connected with everything. But then sometimes you sit quietly and people would sit and remember that they'd been put in an orphanage. You know, and how desolate it was there. And they'd weep for a long time. And then all of a sudden, doing compassion practice, they'd realize they weren't just weeping for themselves, but they were weeping for every child that's been an orphan in this world. Hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions. And realizing that they were carrying that particular suffering, which is part of humanity, and shifting from taking it, oh, it's all so personal, to realizing this is part of the web of of life that we all carry in some fashion or other. And it was very beautiful to watch both the healing and the kind of universal opening. And people left, God, they were, you know, they looked so young. They did. They came in haggard and tired and busy to get their, you know, life together so they could sit for a long retreat. And they left. It's the the Vipassana facelift, we call it. You know, like, like... we teachers were tired, but they looked <laughs> like these, you know, reborn. It was very, very beautiful to see. But the point isn't so much that some particular thing happened. Because um, meditation really means opening to everything. Uh, and sometimes the difficult ones are as important, the, you know, the realization that came that not only was I an orphan, but there are hundreds of millions of orphans, and almost everyone experiences that uh, loneliness at some time in their life, and it's part of humanity. Then they could hold themselves in the world in a much more liberated way, with the great heart of compassion. So how do you do this? How do you enter the world as a bodhisattva? The bodhisattvas rely on two things. A deep knowing or understanding and a deep intention. So here's the deep knowing part. The deep knowing part is the knowing of what the Buddha in his Four Noble Truths and the First Noble Truth called dukkha. That is the inevitable difficulties and suffering in life along with its beauty. That incarnation, I don't know how you got born into this body and mind, and you don't either exactly, but you're here. It's kind of so mysterious. Here you have this human life. And that to be born in the human realm is to be born within the wharf and weft of um, joy and sorrow, birth and death, praise and blame, gain and loss, fame and disrepute. Anybody not have that? I'm just checking here. Pleasure and pain. That it's actually what makes up human incarnation. And dukkha then means that you can't make a life that's all secure and pleasant and unchanging in just this way that you might imagine. That it's not about an ideal. It's about being human. And somehow in embracing your humanity, what Oscar Wilde called the tainted glory of humanity that you find your Buddha nature. Not by changing yourself, but by living with freedom and compassion in the middle of it. So the knowing of dukkha. Um, I was teaching with Pema Chodron in San Francisco. A few years ago we did an evening at Masonic Auditorium and there were 3,000 people there or so on compassion. Pema did these beautiful teachings and at one point took questions and some woman, young woman stood up whose partner had committed suicide a few weeks before and was so distraught and the words and energy of her voice were so raw with suffering. And Pema talked to her about holding every part of it with compassion because it's very complicated when someone commits suicide. There is grief 
but there's also anger. How could you? And then there's guilt. What could I have done? And shame and, and you know, loss and every, all these emotions together. And then when Pema was done, I could feel how lonely she was. So I asked, how many other people in this room have had a family member or someone really close to you commit suicide? And I don't know, maybe it was 200 out of those 3,000, 8% or something, stand up, raise their hands. And I simply asked, would you look at her? And I asked her, this young woman, keep your eyes open. And those of you who are, who, you know, who are looking at her, let her know even without words um, that she's not alone. That, let her know what you've learned. And it was an amazing moment without anything being said. It was just this connectedness that we have as human beings um, when we survive some of the most difficult things and still can love somehow another person who's going through the same thing. So somehow the bodhisattvas need to know this and know how to say it. Not that it's all right, but that it's not all of who you are. Elie Wiesel, the Nobel laureate, writes, Suffering confers neither privileges nor rights. It all depends on how you use it. If you use it to increase the anguish of yourself or others, you are degrading, even betraying it. And yet the day will come when we shall understand that suffering can elevate human beings. God help us to bear our suffering well. So the Bodhisattva doesn't pretend that the world isn't the way that it is, but knows that this is part of reality and also knows that it's not the end of the story. So Dina Metzger, a friend and poet, she writes... Give me everything mangled and bruised, and I will make a light of it to make you weep. And we will have rain, and we will begin again. Because the the teachings or the awakening of the Buddha within yourself, and always so, is that there is sorrow and suffering, but there is also freedom. There's a great heart of compassion, there's the redemption that is part of the glory of our humanity. And it's here in every one. Um, Each one of us is a survivor in one way or another, and magnificently so, even though sometimes it's been very difficult and you might have found ways to judge yourself and say, well, that's not good enough. But you're here, and anything's possible. So this is the Christian mystic Thomas Merton who lived in monastery in Gethsemane Abbey. And once in a while he'd leave the temple to go out and he says it's, it's um, in Kentucky. He said, there I was in Louisville at the corner of Walnut and 4th Street in the center of the shopping district and I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all those people and that they were mine and I theirs and we could not be alien to one another even though we were total strangers. It was like waking from a dream of separateness, of spurious self-isolation and maybe monastic holiness. The sense of liberation from an illusory difference was such a relief and joy that I laughed out loud. I have the immense joy of being member of a race in which the divine spark became incarnate. There's no way of telling people that they're all walking around shining like the sun. And you know this too. You know on those days and hours when you can see the secret beauty in everyone you pass, or even in yourself when you look in the mirror. And you know that there's a kind of fundamental goodness or... um, I don't know, thinking of little George being up here in the beginning, the child of the spirit that's born in every being, that's innocent and amazed and pure, that also is inviolable in you as well. And I like to tell the story, I'll tell it again, of Jarvis Masters on death row in San Quentin. 
and I've worked the San Quentin Prison Project for 10 years or more. Um, and Jarvis was a Buddhist practitioner, took vows from Thrangu Rinpoche, Bodhisattva vows, and has written a couple of books about his experience. Anyway, he was out in the yard in the winter a few years ago. And the yard in San Quentin is this amazing experience because there's the kind of wire fence that you can see through, chain link with razor wire at the top, and guard towers with guys with their automatic weapons, right? And through the chain link fence are sailboats and, you know, windsurfers. And, and the bay in this most amazing, I mean, it's what a piece of real estate. There's Mount Tam and it's gorgeous. But you're in there behind the wires. And Anyway, so it had rained and there were a lot of puddles in the yard and a big seal came and flapped down into one of the puddles. And the guy next to Jarvis, who was a young man, and a lot of the guys in there work out, really buff. There's kind of place to do all your weights and things like that. And this guy picks up a rock to throw it at the seagull. And if you don't understand that, you haven't been hanging out with young men recently like to kind of hunt and things like that. But anyway, there it was. Um, and Jarvis, because he'd taken the Bodhisattva vow, sticks his arm out to stop him. And the guy shouts, Butch, what the fuck do you think you're doing, man? You know, I mean, it's prison and you don't mess with people's personal space. You don't. And the yard gets really quiet, like something's going to come down because it's tough. And Jarvis sits there for a moment and then he turns to the guy and he said, that bird got my wings. And the guy says, huh? What do you mean? He kind of puts his rock down. What are you talking about? And Jarvis just sort of half smiles and gets up and walks away. And for two weeks, everybody would come up to Jarvis and say, what do you mean, Jarvis, that bird got my wings? What does that mean? Jarvis never said a word. He said, when you get in trouble, just say something really crazy. (laughs) But, But you know what he means. You know exactly what he means. He means the same thing that Nelson Mandela meant, you know, 27 years, which included torture and some... That, that you can be put in prison and the circumstances can be difficult, but no one can touch your spirit. And so the Bodhisattva knows that there is sorrow in the world and at the same time difficulties and struggles. It's part of the game and also knows the spirit of freedom that is possible wherever you are. The other thing that the Bodhisattva has is a deep intention. Those vows that I talked about, um, sentient beings are numberless, you know, I vow to save them or bring awakening to them all, and so forth, or as Zen Master Suzuki Roshi said, even if the sun should arise in the West, the Bodhisattva has only one way. Even if the world turns upside down and things become confused, the way of the Bodhisattva is to bring compassion and wakefulness to this circumstance, whatever (laughs) comes. And in this way, to take the vows of a bodhisattva, or to reflect on them, or to find them in your own language, in yourself, is to set the compass of your heart in a direction that says, no matter what, this is the direction, um, this is the direction that I off- to which I offer my life, no matter what happens. And... Mm, I had the chance to tell a story to the Dalai Lama. I was giving some teachings a, a couple of years ago, and um, he kind of disagreed with me. We got a little, we got a little bit of a disagreement about this, which is always fun. Anyway, you don't always get to teach the Dalai Lama, but it was this interesting <laughs> circumstance. Because okay? I was talking about bodhisattvas, and um, and he said, well, strictly speaking, bodhisattvas are those who've taken a vow in front of a Buddha in this ritualized way for enlightenment and so forth. And you're just using bodhisattva in a kind of... um, not the traditional way. and It's not exactly what it means. And I said, well, it's now become a part of our language. 
And also, we, he was giving awards. This was an award ceremony I was speaking at. And there were 50 people from around the world that we'd gathered together. And <clears throat> here was a woman who'd made um, safe houses for abused girls in Bangladesh. And there were 200 houses for these girls to go to. And here was a guy who'd worked his whole life to make HIV clinics in sub Sahara Africa, you know, and given his whole life and saved, I don't know. 50,000 or 100,000 lives. And here was somebody else who'd been planting trees in this desert. It was amazing people. I called them bodhisattvas. And Dalai Lama said, oh, I'm not sure. He said, but then he said, even me, maybe not bodhisattva. I said, okay, girl, if you're not a bodhisattva, we're in trouble. You know? <clears throat> but anyway, I did get to tell him a story, which I had wanted to, because I thought it would inspire him, about this beautiful teacher in Sri Lanka, Ari Ratana, who was the Gandhi of Sri Lanka. And during the Civil War, when they were trying to broker a peace treaty with the Norwegians, Ari called all his people out together. And he said the Buddhist uh, understanding is that the foolish look at the um, current situation and the wise look at the causes and conditions. And it's taken 500 years for us to get in this civil war mess that we're in. 400 years of British colonial oppression and 500 years of conflict between the Hindus and the Buddhists and the Muslims and 200 years of economic disparity between the rich, wet parts of the island and the poor, poor, dry parts. So what I offer you, and he offered it to 650,000 people that were gathered at the oldest temple in Sri Lanka, is the Sarvodia 500-year peace plan. He said, if it took us 500 years, it's going to take us 500 years to get out of this. Five years of uh, ceasefire, 10 years of, learning, of repairing roads and building schools again, 25 years to learn one another's language and culture, 50 years of an economic program to right the disparities, And after 100 years, we will have our first Grand Council to see if we're on the right path. And then we'll do it again and again. And I think in 500 years, we can make a really beautiful island for ourselves. And I heard this. Ari's a friend, and I I just wept because um, it was the vision of an elder, of somebody who wasn't worried about the polls, the focus group, the next election cycle, but who was speaking what was really true for the community. It was the voice of wisdom. And of course, when you think about the Dalai Lama and the terrible circumstances in Tibet that he also has to worry about, um, then I added these words from Thomas Merton. He says, Do not depend on the hope of results. You may have to face the fact that your work will be apparently worthless at times, and achieve no result at all, if not perhaps bring about its opposite. As you get used to this, you start more and more to concentrate not on the results, but on the value, the rightness, and the truth of the work itself. Which is to say that you set a direction and you plant the best seeds that you possibly can. And you know that if you plant seeds of compassion, or justice, or care, or wakefulness, or freedom, that sooner or later, however long it takes, that they will bear fruit. So, to set the compass of your heart as a bodhisattva means to find the deepest intention, the most beautiful thing you could do with your life, which is really what makes your heart happy, and let that be a a kind of reference. And then even when you go through difficulties, or when you get few confused or doubt, or should I do this or that, you go back, you get quiet for a little bit, like Gandhi took a day a week just to sit quietly in the middle of all the bringing down of the British Empire. For every week, he'd take a day in silence and say, wait, we have the, you know, the king, the prime minister, all these things happening. He said, well, I, I, this is Friday or whatever day it was, Thursday. This is my quiet day. We'll deal with it tomorrow. I don't mean you have to take a day a week. But you have to take a time to quiet yourself and s- somehow reconnect with the deepest intention you have. And before you go and to speak to somebody, even if it's a, you know, a difficult conversation you're going to have, you can ask yourself, what's my highest intention? Is it to be right, you know, to get back, or all those other things? What's the highest intention I have? 
and it changes everything. Now, what also helps the Bodhisattva in this way is to have trust. As Pablo Neruda, the poet, writes, you can pick all the flowers, but you can't stop the spring. And there's some um, eternal round of beauty and birth that we see in a spring day like this that continues in spite of and in the midst of all the difficulties in our life or in the world. And we're a part of it and we get to contribute and then, of course, we get older and sick and we die. So let's not be like totally cheery about this. I mean, it's, it's this, that's how it works in the human realm. But there is also this principle of renewal that you are a part of and that you leave your, leave your seeds as a part of and that you see all around you. Um, and it allows you to have a connection with eternity that's not just your own small life, but your place in the unfolding in this beautiful dance. And since all this wild stuff has been happening politically, Howard Zinn, who died last year, the author of uh, The People's History of America, he actually wrote this a few years ago um, during um, the beginning of the war in Iraq and kind of the time of discouragement. And he said, the thing that you need to understand about the world, don't give up your hope, because you need to understand its utter unpredictability. That no one can predict the game. No one could have predicted the Russian Revolution. And Lenin himself was surprised. He was out of the country and had to hurry back when the Tsar was overthrown. Oh, okay, there was a revolution. Or no one could have predicted the end of the Cold War and, you know, the Gorbachev dissolution of the entire Soviet empire, an extraordinary thing, any more than anyone could have predicted what's happening in happened Tunisia and Egypt and Libya and Yemen and Syria and Jordan, and it's extraordinary. A year ago, people would have laughed at that. And he said, to be hopeful in hard times is not just foolishly romantic. It's based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion sacrifice, courage, and kindness. And what we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. If we see only the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something. But if we remember the times and places, and there are so many where people have behaved magnificently, this gives us the energy to act and the possibility of sending this world in a new and better direction. So somehow, there is in taking these vows the the sense of trust in us um, that we can and will in some way learn to handle the things that are difficult. And sometimes you start small. It's not like you have to do some huge thing. I remember walking with my teacher, Ajahn Chah, and there was this great big boulder over there. He said, see that boulder over there? Is it heavy? And we all said yes. And he said, not if you don't pick it up. (laughs) And he just laughed, you know. Um, And his teaching was to do, to, to plant the seeds that you could plant and to take each moment and do the best with that moment and that that would develop. That's part of how human beings work. And to trust that that would grow. So there's a kind of trust in ourselves in the world. There's also the understanding that when we become present, it's possible to respond rather than to react to things. You know, if we're not mindful or attentive um, in some way, then we act out of habit, and those habits play out. Um, But if we can get quiet, even for a moment, take a breath, center ourselves, whether you remember your deep intention or just quiet yourself, then things that, you know, seem difficult become more workable. And sometimes it's the inner and sometimes it's the outer. Children's Letters to God, those little books that that have those, you know, second grade um, Sunday school letters. Dear God, maybe Cain and Abel would not kill each other so much if they had their own rooms. It works with me and my brother, Larry. You know, and so sometimes there's a there's a kind of a inner necessity, but then sometimes 
um, when you actually quiet down, you actually have to change the circumstances, and both are important. I read this story other times. A poet, friend, Oriah Mountain Dreamer, writes, at the end of a very long day of teaching meditation and a seminar, a small, thin woman in an oversized parka introduced herself as Isabel. Can I do this meditation on my own, she asked. Yes, I said, I'm sure you can, although many people find it easier to establish meditation with the help of a group. It's hard to keep going on your own. But what will it give me? What will I get if I do this every day? Her tone took on a whining quality, and I felt my irritation rise. How fast will it work? I mean, will I feel a difference after a week? How will I know it's working? This was what I detested. The quest for the quick fix, the desire for guaranteed outcome, the simple answer. Do this and you get that. Pay this, you receive that. And my kids were waiting for me. I just wanted to go home. Took a deep breath, looked directly at Isabel, set my knapsack down on the floor, tried to slow down my words, thinking that maybe if I spoke slower, I would feel more patient. Well, I said, meditation is more a process than a goal-oriented activity. It can help you become more aware of what's going on within and around you. My best advice is to try it and just be patient. And I picked up my bag and started to button my coat. I did have to leave, and I wanted to get out of there while I was feeling virtuous for not snapping her head off. (laughs) But as I started to move away, Isabel suddenly reached out and grabbed my arm with surprising strength. But what I really want to know, she said, her voice rising in a crescendo that bordered on panic, is, will it help me find God? I mean, if I meditate, will I have an experience of something or somebody out there listening, somebody with me? And a wave of desperation swept out from her through me, and I was surprised to find my eyes fill with tears. This woman wasn't looking for an easy answer or guaranteed formula because she was lazy. She didn't want a simple plan because she was unable or unwilling to think critically about what would work. She wanted something she knew would work and work quickly because she was hanging on by her fingernails. She wanted something that would work in a week because she was afraid she simply wasn't going to make it through months or years. I put my hand gently over Isabel's where it gripped my arm. It's okay, Isabel. We all feel desperate at times. I said, nobody does it by themselves. We all need help. And her hand relaxed a little beneath mine, and she started to cry. We talked for a while longer. There is no them out there. There's only us. And when I left, I didn't leave one of them. I said goodbye to one of us, a human being doing the best she can, searching for the home for which we all long. So there is this capacity we have to be present for one another or for our life, not in a reactive way, but in a way, as the bodhisattva, that responds. And whether you respond as the warrior or the midwife, you know, whether you respond with intelligent vision or just a moment of, of, you know, the sweetness of compassion, all of those will come from you when you become still and you listen. Learning trust, taking the breath to respond rather than react, big ways and small ways. Also, the Bodhisattva isn't particularly idealistic. Otherwise, you've got to hang up your Bodhisattva shoes. It just doesn't work. When I read Shambhala Sun magazine or Tricycle, I wonder who these people are. They admit to an occasional random thought, but it's clear they're all becoming enlightened, or at least able to dwell constantly in some meditative state. Or those yoga journal people, where everyone is thin, composed, and bends in all directions. (laughs) Or fortune, where everyone's a millionaire, a captain of success. So where, I ask, is the magazine for failure? For 30 years of falling and only later recalling, ah, be here now. For the continuing recovering from the storming, the endless repairing of the broken sails. 
for this thick and heavy body, middle-aged, barely bending, for the immense gratitude in meeting once again next week's payroll, next month's rent. And so like Isabel, you know, there's some way that we're not making ideals about this. And as I've traveled and worked and been with people in all different kinds of circumstances, those who, you know, are disenfranchised and those who seem to be the, you know, ones in charge. And the ones in charge have as hard a time as anybody. They do, really. Um, And the spirit of the Bodhisattva is to be present for this human being as they are. What else helps, not being idealistic, is that the spirit of the Bodhisattva is to be playful and free. Hmm. Another story for you. This is from psychologist Len Bergantino, who was writing about a patient where he had this series of sessions that were really frustrating because the patient was either disconnected, detached, or just trying to please him. And he said, the feeling I had on this particular day, I'm sitting with this patient, and I just didn't want to say one more word to him about anything. So to his surprise, I took out my mandolin, and in the most loving, mellow, beautiful way I could, I played Come Back to Sorrento. He broke down in tears and cried for the last 40 minutes of the session, saying only, Bergantino, you sure earned your money today. And to think I wasted all those years talking to people. But I carry with me, when I teach, this picture. You won't be able to see it very well from the back, but maybe you can a little bit. Um, It's the picture of Vedran Smolovich, the cellist of Sarajevo, playing in the bombed-out National Library of Sarajevo. And during the Balkan War in the 90s, in Bosnia and Serbia and Croatia, um, Sarajevo, which is this magnificent international city, um, was under siege. Mortar and rocket fire, you couldn't get in or out except you and helicopters. Um, and Vedran, who had been a member of the Sarajevo National Symphony, would put on his tux, take his cello in a little folding chair, and would go out to the squares where people had died, where they'd been shot by the snipers or the mortars and bring his cello and play so that the people of Sarajevo wouldn't give up hope. An amazing thing to do. You know, you must admit that there will be music despite everything. And, you know, there's a way in which it can all seem so serious and so difficult In 1969, right out of graduate school, I was drafted into the U.S. Army. After I got new clothing, a haircut, and vaccinations, I filled out a stack of forms. One asked for my religion. Feeling rebellious, I decided to choose a new religion for myself. I wrote Druid, parentheses, Reformed. Two weeks later, I received my dog tag stamped with my name, social security number, blood type, and Druid, Reformed. I wondered how the army would administer last rites for this. Stationed stateside for several months before shipping out, I was looking forward to a big camping weekend in the woods when the commanding officer canceled all weekend passes. There was a large anti-war protest nearby, and he feared many of his soldiers would attend. But I was determined to go camping with my girl. Discovering there was to be a full moon that particular weekend, I requested a two-day pass to celebrate a religious holiday. (laughs) The commanding officer was skeptical. What the hell religion are you, he asked. I told him I was a druid and that the last full moon before the winter solstice was our high holy day. (laughs) He demanded to see my dog tags, so I showed them to him. He looked at them in stunned silence for a moment, (laughs) then granted me the pass. As I was on my way out, he said, Wait a second, don't you guys kill goats? No, sir, I said, that's the Orthodox. I'm reformed. 
The, the point of spiritual practice and religious practice isn't to make it into a grim duty. I mean, if you look at the Dalai Lama, even though he has a great weight of the suffering of Tibet, he also has one of the most beautiful laughs of anybody I ever met. Or my teacher, Mahagosananda, who'd been here, who was the Gandhi of Cambodia, who just exuded love and playfulness, as well as for 15 years leading peace marches through the killing fields and the minefields, bringing people love back in their villages and being, again, nominated three different times for the Nobel Peace Prize. He said, if you can't be happy, what good is your spiritual life? Now and then, says Guillaume Apollinaire, now and then, it is good to pause in our pursuit of happiness and just be happy. (laughs) And so there is a spirit as well in the Bodhisattva that can be present and bring as Aung San Suu Kyi or you know, Nelson or whoever it is, that can bring that kind of openness and beauty uh, no matter the circumstances. O nobly born, says the Buddha, do not forget who you really are. Who took birth in this human body? You know, treasure. Know that you can awaken and that you can plant the seeds of awakening, bring the gift of awakening in the gardens around you to those you touch. Sometimes it's through your stillness. This is from William Butler Yeats. We can make our own minds so still like water that beings gather around us. I should put his phrase right, so like still water that beings gather around us, that they may see their own images and so live for a moment with a clearer, perhaps even a fiercer life because of our quiet. And so that's one gift you can bring from the temple is that stillness in yourself. But then you go out and you act. You bring yourself to the world in the myriad ways that offer them to you. And I guess I'll close with this poem prayer from Diane Ackerman. She calls it school prayer. If there were to be prayer in the schools, this is her version. In the name of daybreak and the eyelids of morning and the wayfaring moon and the night when it departs, I swear I will not dishonor my soul with hatred, but offer myself humbly as a guardian of nature, a a healer of misery, as a messenger of wonder, and an architect of peace. It's kind of modern bodhisattva vows. In the name of daybreak and the eyelids of morning, and the wayfaring moon, and the night when it departs, I swear I will not dishonor my soul with hatred, but offer myself humbly as a guardian of nature, a healer of misery, a messenger of wonder, and an architect of peace.